for me, to me, the most important thing is not the Fed at this point is is the for for Bitcoin, right? Not for equities. Is the the, the Trump Kamala play? Is like who wins? Uh, that's what really we, we really care about the most, I think, till November. Hi everyone, welcome to Bits of Bips, exploring how crypto and macro collide one basis point at a time. I'm your host, James Safer, TradFi Archmaster, Lord of Bloomberg's End, here with Alex Kruger, Kruger Macro of House Asgard, Protector of the Realm, and Joe McCann, Lord Commander of Asymmetric and Master of Bank. We're here to discuss the latest stories in the world of crypto and macro news. Just remember that nothing we say here is investment advice. Please check unchainedcrypto.com slash bits and bips for more disclosures. Also joining us today is a man that needs no introduction, Nick Carter, Lord of Castle Island, Destroyer of Livers, Karate Combat Influencer Champion of the World. Nick, uh, you really don't need an introduction, but tell us who you are real quick, and then we can uh, we can dive into talking about uh, the Bitcoin conference. Thanks, James. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a GP at Castle Island. We invest in, in on the equity side and uh, businesses in the crypto space. And uh, for some reason, I'm an amateur fighter now as well. <laughs> so undefeated, one and zero, soon to be two and zero, <laughs> cage fighter. So yeah. that's uh, something about me too. Don't worry, guys. We are going to get into the karate combat fight. Uh, Bit here, but first let's let's dive into the Bitcoin conference. Key takeaways, I guess, before we even getting talking to like Trump's speech. Uh, what what was there any key takeaways you guys had? I guess turn it over to you, Alex. What what, what was something you were watching or you noticed that you paid close attention to? I mean, we I think I have, and we have so many takeouts, all of us, right? I mean, this was I think was one of the most incredible moments in in in, in history for for crypto. Uh, overall, uh, we can go from like from from things Trump said to to the market's reaction to to people's reaction, which is not the same as the market, right? Um, uh, first of all, I gotta say it's like so so today for traders, we uh, uh, during the conference price uh, like pretty much stopped every every short term guy out. The spiking up and down, there was quite significant. Uh, uh, buy the news, sell the rumor into uh, into the event. Uh, then Trump, I think he delivered um, everything, almost everything that, that we could have expected uh, from him. And um, we had a, like a quiet, surprisingly quiet weekend. And then, then uh, into the open yesterday, we ran up and up to like 69, almost 70. Today, we hit 70,000 on the dot. And collapsed, and then and then wham! Uh, so it, it's very significant because it's we we had a very very significant news hit the tape. We ran up to seventy thousand again and went straight down uh, seven seven eight percent uh, down to sixty six. Pretty brutal movement. And uh, if uh, today I was away from the market, but if I had so I may I may have missed something. Uh, it's Monday, by the way. Uh, but if I had to rationalize what happened, I think is the Kamala Harris trade, is the market putting emphasis and and uh, on the polls that are coming very strong for for Kamala, and uh, and the reason I'm saying this is because if you look at small caps, small caps is is a key component of the Trump trade, meaning Trump is good for small caps. Small caps today are down one point two percent, one point one. They were like sharply up. On the open, then 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 drop, not a collapse, but but a significant move down. And uh, in the meantime, tech stocks are flat in the day. The Dow is up. So I think is the the, the Kamala trade and and basically Bitcoin is the main uh, or one of the main uh, uh, plays in this Trump Kamala trade. What do you guys think? I'll add a little bit just with some market structure color there. So. Um... I think Alex's point about the Kamala trade has some credence to it, but I do want to point out a couple things that happened over the weekend, and then certainly on the on the cash equities open for the stock market on Monday. Um, so one week, like at the money vols uh, in options for Bitcoin, were like seventy five on Saturday. They were fifty today, and so a lot of people were buying um, August second, which is the expiration for this week in in kind of uh in lieu of the the trump speech which you know kind of makes sense right if you think he's going to say something that's really material that can move the market you probably want to get some leverage on through options um but after his speech those vols started to come down really fast and today um the same thing happened 
right? You had you had uh, you know Asia, um, like to Alex's point, they were buying all throughout the day. Even Europe, you know, t- pushed it up to call it seventy k to the tick. Then the cash equity open happened. Vols got crushed, and you know the 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 sell programs began. And you can just look at like the chart for the from you know nine thirty Eastern to four p.m. Eastern, and it's basically straight down sell programs now. Why did that happen? More more sellers than buyers, but more importantly, um, <laughs> there's also like there's also a lot of of basis trading that still goes on, and folks tend to you know they can they can sell uh, the CME futures, um, and and buy the underlying uh, ETF as as kind of like a quasi basis trade, if you will. But we've seen this now. Last week, Monday through Thursday was just offered heavily ahead of the Trump you know, uh, speech at the conference. And on Friday, we caught a bid. And here we are Monday again, up near 70k. And it's just heavily offered again. Now, the, the one caveat I'll add that, that Alex was somewhat alluding to, there's this really powerful inverse correlation between Bitcoin price and NASDAQ. And when it goes heavily negative, it's usually a bottom for Bitcoin. So we saw this actually a couple weeks ago. Today, NASDAQ was up, Bitcoin was down. Um, we've got huge tech earnings later this week, so that could be factoring into how some folks are playing this correlation trade. I would suspect that if tomorrow or Wednesday, when this airs, Nasdaq is down, you'll probably see Bitcoin up. Yeah, I mean, I, we we talked about this last time. I think that breakdown in that relationship. I, I actually, I, I interviewed Robbie Michnick at the Bitcoin conference on on Thursday for people who were there for the industry panel, uh, and I got into. We can get into the stuff that he said, but. He talked about how this breakdown in correlations between Bitcoin and tech stocks is a very good thing for as far as they're concerned. A lot of their clients care about the fact that Bitcoin has low to zero correlation to traditional assets. So the fact that it was so correlated to tech stocks in, in some of the run-ups uh, as what was going on with rates the last couple of years um, was not necessarily a good thing. He also said that he basically didn't like the fact that people were calling Bitcoin a risk-on asset. Uh, he thought that was doing a disservice to what Bitcoin was. Which I kind of get. I've heard that from Bitcoiners for a long time. I kind of view it as a bit of a risk on asset. But to hear BlackRock's heads of digital assets basically making that same argument as I'm used to hearing from hardcore Bitcoiners, um, I thought was pretty powerful. Nick, do you have anything to add? But what, what were some of your key takeaways? Do you disagree with some of the market topics that uh, Joe and Alex are talking about? Well, just on Alex's point, the Camilla trade is interesting because you know Trump's the favorite in the prediction markets, as far as I can tell. But then we see very strong polls favoring. Camilla. So I I don't really know where the market stands on that. I haven't seen her prospects. I haven't seen her rallying that much in the prediction markets, but the polls and just the general enthusiasm I see and, and her improvement and favorability on the Democratic base does suggest that she's rallying here. And certainly, um, you know, we haven't seen any real indications that, that she would favor Bitcoin in any way. So I think describing Bitcoin as part of the Trump trade is, is accurate. So yeah, that's just something that continues to puzzle me about the market is is the divergence between prediction markets and then the actual polling. Yeah, I think there. I think basically my my thing is that I saw it's like June. It was like Trump was heavily favored, uh, or Trump was slightly favored in June, and he really started picking up after that debate. And now he's backed out, and Trump's might only be slightly favored as far as the polling goes. I think part of that might be that I think the prediction markets people tend to probably lean right would be my guess. So I think we probably have to discount. The prediction market percentage odds, but that's who I, I don't know of any academic or real research, but that's just my my inkling and finding that I that I've seen out there. As far as the Trump speech goes, I don't know if you guys agree or I'll, I'll tell you my overall thoughts. I was there live, for, I almost fell asleep at some points, <laughs> but I mean he basically delivered on like ninety nine percent of what people hoped and dreamed that Trump would say, and people in my mentions were acting like it was the worst speech ever, and he didn't he didn't say anything that people wanted to say. And people are complaining about the speech. Hey, James, I, I will... James, I'm sorry. J- James, people on the internet are upset about something? <laughs> so weird. Yeah, I feel like every these people, like, they just have never seen Trump speak before or something. Like, they're yeah. just like, he's just rambling on. I'm like, this is exactly how Trump does every other speech. <laughs> he hit everything he wanted. He said he's going to fire Gary Gensler. He said he's going to end the war on crypto. He gave you a shout out, Nick. He said he was going to end Chokepoint 2.0. Congrats on that. Just for those that don't know, that's Nick coined that term. Uh, I mean, he said he was going to add a, a, what word did he use? A, a stockpile, a Bitcoin stockpile. He didn't say strategic reserve, but he said he was going to hold all the Bitcoin. I mean, I don't know what else anyone could want aside from the fact that they just don't like Trump's speech style, which honestly isn't that crazy considering the way that he does, he says anything. But I'll turn it over to you, Nick. How how floored were you when, you, when he called out Chokepoint 2.0? 
Yeah, I mean, he's getting advice some, from some very smart people. Um, <laughs> and it, it is remarkable that I wrote a blog post on Pirate Wires and then that, that became part of the political discourse in this country. It blew my mind, actually. Hey, Nick, can you actually explain for the, the listeners what yeah. Choke Point 2.0 is? Yeah, so Choke Point 1.0 was the actual name of a official program under the Obama administration to marginalize certain types of businesses that they didn't like uh, through unconstitutional means, basically by having bank regulators apply pressure to the banks to apply pressure to payment processors to unbank or um, de-risk certain businesses, primarily uh, gun manufacturers, payday lenders, and then all sorts of other, uh, the adult industry, you know, all sorts of businesses, some of them politically disfavored, like firearms, and then some were just random industries that were targeted by the Obama admin. They called it choke point. That wasn't something that, the you know, it sounds so sinister. That was the official name for it. It's incredible. And that sort of ended, basically ended when Trump came into office after FTX in January of 23, a similar thing resumed. Primarily the Fed and the FDIC were the driving forces. And the chair of the FDIC, Grunberg, under Biden, was the same one. He was in office under Trump. He'd done it before. It was, he was in office under Obama, sorry. And his similar playbook, basically banks going, or re rather federal uh, financial regulators going to banks and using insinuations to and threats and telling them to debank certain industries and specifically crypto. Uh, and I feel that they did it uh, after FTX because at that point they felt that they had the political air cover to do it. And uh, it worked. I mean, you know, if you're early stage startup in crypto and you you want to get access to banking, it's very hard. It's very expensive. It, re it was very effective and it's still in effect. We are the ones that called it choke point 2.0 because it's very reminiscent of, of 1.0. That's not the official name for it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is extremely sinister. And it's really challenged the industry domestically, and, and it remains a huge, huge problem. So it was very, very meaningful, I think, to, to the entire industry that Trump specifically called that out. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we talked, I think, on one of the first episodes of Bits and Bips about when the FDIC uh, chair stepped down. It was like when all this kind of sea change events were happening with respect to the, the Biden administration on crypto. I think it was in May timeframe. And we referenced Choke Point 2.0. I mean, as a, you know, somebody running an investment firm in digital assets, I know you know this all too well, Nick. It is incredibly difficult to get any sort of banking related services. And our portfolio companies run into the same issues. So to see it as part of this, like, you know, <laughs> political discourse from a presidential candidate who's a former president, irrespective of your views on politics, you know, for or against Trump, like, it's pretty remarkable. And, you actually mentioned this in a in a tweet that um, you 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 so rightfully got to post a shirtless photo of yourself after you won your fight. You talked about a couple of things, and can and I don't want to like uh, spoil it for for the listeners or the viewers, but can you maybe you talked about uh, you know choke point two point in there, but the spirit of the tweet I think resonated with a lot of people about what you can actually do, and can you maybe just talk a little bit about that? and the, the the points that you made in there and then we can obviously dig into the fight yeah people love this tweet man <laughs> so obviously the context is that i won a karate fight uh despite never having fought ever i've never thrown a punch or had any not even a schoolyard fight i wasn't a fighter and uh you know uh the point is you like anyone can become anything obviously given you know various caveats if you have desire and discipline that's it um, and you know, I think the point of the tweet is, you know, you have agency and you just have to shoot, you know, pursue it. And that goes for getting into mixed martial arts as an untrained person. And that goes for my reporting around choke point 2.0, which was very politically impactful, even though I'm not a journalist at all, you know, it's just a, it was a rabbit hole I decided to chase and. I talked to sources and acted like I was a journalist, but I'm not. Wrote that one up, and then it ended up influencing political discourse in this country. So, yeah, I just wanted to encourage people and share a bit about my journey, which, uh, you know, I, I don't often share personal details on, on Twitter. and But, you know, I thought it was a pretty opportune moment to do so.
Yeah, it, w- it was awesome. But now let's talk about the fight because everybody's wanting to know about the fight. I mean, we obviously know that you won. Can you maybe talk about your opponent, like your training, you know, what it was like in the ring? I think a lot of folks will see these, you know, we, we watch the karate combats and, you know, th- these these kind of like you saw bit boy fighting and it's, you know, it's a bit entertaining <laughs> to say the least, but like. I think you took it a little, you know, you took it seriously. So do you want to just walk us through like the journey and then, you know, ultimately the, the fight itself, what it was like and your opponent and all that? Yeah. So for context, Karate Combat is a fight promotion with actual professional signed fighters. And then also in parallel, there's an influencer fight promotion on there, which is very amusing that it's a mashup of sort of like real fighters and then ordinary people like me. The format is mixed martial arts, basically like UFC, but without submissions. So that's the main difference. So you can't put someone in a chokehold or an arm bar or anything. Uh, and it's designed for action. It's designed for knockouts. And uh, I saw BitBoy fight. He fought. He won. And people are like people's attitudes to BitBoy changed after that <laughs> remarkably. Um, I actually saw him after my fight. Um, he's a pretty nice guy in person. I'll say that. And I had been to these fights because I'm a fight fan. And they asked me to fight. And uh, I didn't know the first thing about fighting. This was in sort of March or February, March. And I figured that I could do it. Um, I wanted to challenge myself. And as I said in one of the tweets yesterday, I had like really tough like health issues uh, in December and January. And I wanted an excuse to for try and get into excellent shape. And I know that being in shape for fighting is basically the best shape imaginable. And so I did a, like a fight camp like I actually and I was slated to fight David Hoffman, of course, the first time um, until he he had to pull out a week before. And so I did my first camp, didn't get to fight. And then the organizers found me someone who's roughly my experience level and my exact size. Uh, he's called Cody Kuhn. He works for one of my portfolio companies, DFX Finance. <laughs> so Eddie, wait, 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 time out. Time out. You're, go- you're glancing over that. So you 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 KO'd one of your Portco's uh, employees. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> good, good, good luck on uh, sourcing good deals going forward. Hey, yeah. hey, I'm going to invest, but I might knock you out. <laughs> he knew what he was signing up for, and I knew that he could KO me, right? Like we, yeah, totally. We both took it seriously. He was ex-military. He's a military veteran, and uh, he was in shape. Like He showed up. He had abs. He looked good. And uh, he had a little bit less training than me because I sort of had two training camps. He had one, but I was starting from absolute scratch. I think he had a, a more of a wrestling background, actually. If you if you watch the fight, you can tell he had a single leg takedown on me, which is a wrestling takedown. And uh, he was game, and he was ser- really tough guy. And I took it seriously. I knew that the format was very prone to knockouts. And I sat in that locker room all day as the other fights went on. And these guys would trickle back into the locker room and they'd be completely busted up. Just horribly, (laughs) horribly bruised. In some cases, he got knocked out. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is what await. This is my fate in a few minutes. (laughs) How long long are you sitting in there? How long are you sitting in the locker room? Seven hours I waited <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> in the locker room, just the, the stress levels building. I did sit next to Aljamain Sterling, who's an active UFC fighter, bantamweight, really successful fighter, which was very, very cool. I got to harass him and ask him some questions. But yeah, and then I, I got to the fight and it was completely instinctual. I, did, I wasn't able to really execute my fight plan at all. I, uh, did, I had actually mainly trained boxing, but my boxing skills were not on display that night it looked terrible <laughs> from a hands perspective i didn't throw a single right cross which i was meant to uh i didn't level change on the jab i didn't throw an overhand right which i was meant to do <laughs> and uh in the end it came down to knees and kicks and i landed a few really good knees to the body in the clinch i grappled with him effectively and i landed a liver kick that shut him down and was able to finish him with the hand so i am very very glad that it lasted only a minute because i was getting tired and i didn't want to fight three rounds so very very lucky i was able to get the ko and and walk away totally unscathed yeah i was uh i was gonna say i i was there for <laughs> i was there waiting for you i thought i was gonna miss your fight so i got there a little after nine and i was like i think he's gonna fight like nine thirty, 
And I was there for two and a half hours waiting for you. And I was actually, for those in the audience, I already told Nick this. I was like literally 10 feet from him when he got the KO, which was awesome. So shout out to Nick O'Neill or Choose Rich Nick for, for getting me in there. Uh, but yeah, it was awesome. Congrats, Nick. It was, it looked awesome. It was, it was a good fight. I wish it lasted longer than a minute, though. It would have been a little more entertaining, but that's okay. Out of curiosity, why seven, seven hours in the locker? That seems like a really, you know, kind of like counterproductive, no, for, for, you know, being ready. Yeah, I actually brought my laptop and I was working in there. And <laughs> everyone was like, Nick, what are you doing? I'm like, guys, you don't understand. I'm a venture capitalist. You guys, yeah. are, <laughs> you guys are professional fighters. I do Excel for a living. I have, to, <laughs> I have to do Excel right now. They're all like hitting pads and like warming up and like talking to their coach. And I'm tapping away, writing a stable coin report in the locker room. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they made it. <laughs> they made us wait because the Tennessee Athletic Commission needed everyone there for the whole duration. I was the last fight. I was the main event. And they made us all do medicals in the stadium and actually one of the influencers failed the medical and they'd cancel a fight because of that so they took it extremely serious it was a wow. sanctioned fight yeah. uh drug tested physicals blood tests everything like a serious like serious real deal fight wow well uh if this uh bitcoin thing doesn't work out you know mma is in your future there may be another fight I will. I'll tease oh, that. Oh, breaking news fight. on bits and bits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, come to Singapore. Come to Token Twenty Forty Nine. Oh, I'll be there. Yes, awesome. Well, um, I, I know we talked a little bit about some of the stuff that was at the conference, primarily the the Trump speech. But uh, one thing that we should probably talk about <clears throat> is um, what happened immediately after the Trump speech, which was Senator Loomis. Uh, announcing an announcement of a bill that she's uh, looking to author for, you know, creating a, a strategic Bitcoin reserve in, in the United States. So uh, for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with this, uh, Senator Loomis out of Wyoming, Wyoming's a very blockchain, Bitcoin friendly state. She's very pro Bitcoin, pro crypto. Um, she more or less, uh, I, I think, wanted to get some credit for what uh, Trump, if Trump gets elected, uh, hey, I, I, I wanted to put this bill out first or, or whatever it may actually be. But in, in essence, what, what stood out to me was some of the details behind it. One, um, wanting to actually create like a strategic reserve of Bitcoin. Two, the amount, uh, which is uh, roughly, I think, 5% of the supply, which I think is if my math is correct, roughly like sixty-eight billion dollars worth of Bitcoin at at current prices, or roughly in that in that neighborhood, and that would be purchased over the course of of five years. But three, and I would love to get uh, Nick's perspective on this, given that you know you yeah, you're pretty knowledgeable with the Bitcoin miner space. I think she had mentioned something to the effect of the United States actually creating sort of their own you know secure sort of decentralized set of of Bitcoin miners um, to secure the network. So to me, this is uh, I mean, obviously, it's it's great for all of us in crypto, but it is a it's a pretty forward thinking bill coming from uh, Senator Loomis. So, so Nick, why don't we start off with you, and then we can we can pass it off to James and Alex to see if they have any perspective. What what was your kind of original takeaway or thoughts from the Loomis bill? And you know, do you think it's going to pass? Do you think there's going to be like some additions or subtractions from it? What is your overall view? Well, I think Trump's proposal is much more pragmatic politically and. He's basically saying we're going to keep the Bitcoins that we've already seized, which itself is actually questionable. Um, I hate to say it <laughs> because so those Bitcoins aren't really the U.S. government's property. You know, <laughs> like a lot of those Bitcoins were came from the Bitfinex hack, so they belong to Bitfinex or users, creditors, whatever. So I even actually have issues with that, frankly. But in terms of a political prudence, Trump's plan it has a much lower attack surface. Uh, if he were to endorse just straight up market buying Bitcoin um, through whatever mechanism, I think that would really leave him open to attack from Democrats and he still has to win the election. So Loomis, you know, she, I don't think uh, as uh, great as she is for crypto, I don't think she has that much clout in Washington. And so I see this as a statement of intent. It's a way to endear herself to the Bitcoin community, but I don't think there's any odds whatsoever of this bill passing 
but yeah, I, I like Trump's idea of just sitting on the seized Bitcoin, although we, we are going to have to work out who it belongs to. I mean, if it, rightfully, some of those Bitcoins should go back to Bitfinex. So even that one, I think, uh, has some issues. Yeah, two things I, I would say. Uh, one, I was telling clients that I thought that's what Trump would do. I didn't think he was going to say up market buying. RFK was a lot more aggressive. I will also say RFK, I, I don't know how much Trump actually knows about Bitcoin. I know he knows what talking points to hit. He has very smart people that know this industry well and what to say. RFK, on the other hand, like was able to go deep on various topics relating to Bitcoin and blockchain in general, stable coins, what have you. Um, so that was one thing I want to say. The other thing I would say, you mentioned the Bitfinex Act. Uh, Eric Wall talked about that on Twitter, but also Ro Rosalind Khan was, I saw her multiple times at the conference and she, she's the one. She was at the fight. The, she was at the I fight. I gave her a hug. I gave yeah. her a hug after I won the fight. <laughs> <laughs> so if for those that don't know, her and her boyfriend uh, are the ones that have, I guess, have they been convicted? I, they've been con the, accused of the, being the ones that perpetrated the Bitfinex hack. Um, so a lot of those coins that we're talking about <laughs> actually kind of- Wait. Came from her. <laughs> when when the U.S. becomes the Bitcoin nation, we have Razzle Khan to thank for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Razzle Khan. We could share now her her sticker. <laughs> There's that's right. Uh, she hands out the stickers. They're pretty yeah. great. One thing I do want to say on the Lemus bill is I did the math, and I think we own about three point something, three point four percent of all the above ground gold. So her proposal is actually more aggressive because if I was to come up with a number of how much Bitcoin we should buy if we were to buy some i would imagine you would just match the amount of gold and so she's actually going further than that because she wants to buy a million out of 21 million bitcoins which is where five ish percent so hers is even more aggressive well the art of the deal is you ask for more than you actually want and then you settle on where you want to go so maybe that's the plan nice plug on the art of the deal look i mean the the the, the, the fascinating thing about um her, you know, yeah, going more aggressive on the sides. I mean, obviously, we know that there's a fixed amount of Bitcoin, and we also know that there's millions of Bitcoins that are lost. And so I think the true supply is is less, which would increase the percentage even more if it's a million Bitcoin. But I think the point that you made, Nick, is that the above ground gold that we know of is 3.4%. We know the fixed amount of Bitcoin and so uh, I think RFK, I could be wrong, was was coming out even more aggressive to match the notional value of the gold that we have, which would have been like <laughs> $800 billion or something in Bitcoin. So it, 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 it's just all the all the Bitcoins, all the Bitcoin. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I own all of it. All right. Um, but yeah, I, I look, I, I also agree. I don't think this bill actually goes anywhere, uh, certainly ahead of a presidential election. If the Republicans can retain all three branches of Congress, then, you know, maybe there's a modification to it. Maybe there's maybe there's a little bit more give and take with respect to it getting done. But for me, like and we've talked about this in the past, you know, crypto and Bitcoin specifically are, are very narrative driven. It's a very narrative driven asset class when when you're speculating and trading it. And um, the fact that this is now, you know, kind of a quote unquote official part of the discourse of creating this strategic reserve asset or strategic reserve of Bitcoin um, is now bleeding over into other lawmakers in other countries. And so we saw a lawmaker in Hong Kong who's been very pro Web3, crypto, et cetera, also come out and say, you know, we should do something very similar. And I do think this is, <laughs> to, to use the cliche, it's not priced in. I don't think a lot of people have priced in the idea that if this were to actually pass, what other sort of developed countries would end up actually needing or wanting to acquire some percentage of the total Bitcoin supply for their reserves. Um, that I think is, is, a, is a large potential number. Um, but of course, it's path dependent, right? If this never sees the light of day in terms of becoming law, well, the narrative doesn't really matter too much in practice. But for now, it's it certainly has, has operated like a uh, a sufficient tailwind to the already big momentum that's happened since the uh, uh, a failed assassination attempt of Trump. Yeah, it's like that Will Ferrell saying: it just gets the people going. I mean, it, it doesn't <laughs> matter that it's not going to pass because, yeah, it's, I, I think the odds of it passing are like almost zero. Uh, that's that's not the point. The point is to get the people going, to get other people talking. Is the, the fact that we're just talking about this and it's out in the, the news, it's, it's incredible.
uh, let, let me say a, a few things that like like some some phrases from Trump or things that he said that are also just incredible to to, to highlight how far we've gone is things he said is like Bitcoin is new the new steel industry um, um, uh, Bitcoin will surpass gold okay this one is kind of funny Bitcoin Bitcoiners are high Q individuals <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't think he knew that how, how much uh, Bitcoins were were <laughs> Uh, swing, uh, slinging, yeah. Uh, other ones, uh, far, far Gary Gensler, day one. Uh, and uh, we talked about this and choke point uh, two zero, no CBDC, central bank digital currency, right to self custody, freedom of freedom of transaction, turning the US into a Bitcoin mining powerhouse, never sell your Bitcoin. It, it, all things that, that are just incredible. We went from basically uh, just just a couple of years ago, its crypto was uh, uh, disease uh, into the eyes of the establishment. <laughs> we were the faces of a disease, and now they are here. I mean, I'm going to be a little bit explicit now, uh, and uh, I like being explicit sometimes. It, it's kind of like Trump came out and he gave us a job. <laughs> you know, uh, in in in, and and just appreciate it. He came and he he gave us what we wanted. Yeah, he may not deliver in everything. He may not even become president. That's not the point. Everybody's now talking about it. That's what matters. That's right. Yeah, and, and like like we've said on the past, like, remember, a politician's job is to get elected and stay elected. And so, you know, definitely discount a lot of what Trump is saying. But to Alex's point, hey, we're talking about it. It's in the discourse. Mainstream media doesn't have a choice but to start talking about this in some capacity. And other countries' leaders are paying uh, close attention. To and this. he's also committing to like very specific things. So he's not just generally yeah. embracing the industry. Like those are very specific things. Fire Gary Gensler, repeal choke point, create a crypto advisory council and create legislation with 100, within 100 days. These are very specific commitments, which are hard to walk back. Although actually on the fire Gary Gensler front, a lot of people are saying he can't. He can't actually do that. Do that. Yeah, he can't. But <laughs> but James, I looked. I asked ChatGPT, and ChatGPT <laughs> said, if um, Gensler, or if the SEC chair, has sort of like significantly been derelict in his duty, he can be removed. <laughs> and so arguably, all I'm saying is there's like a, maybe a loophole. The two things on that one: the audience was by far the loudest on that on day one. I will fire fire Gary Gensler. And if any, he talked about freeing Ross, freeing Ross. He talked about all these other things that like usually Bitcoiners go up in arms about, but the loudest by far that audience was that as far as I could tell, and I was in the room was firing Gary Gensler as far as firing him. I mean, functionally speaking, yes, you can't technically fire him. It's going to be really hard, but like one, it's standard procedure to like just roll out of your position. If the president turns over and it's not your party, like that's just the way things typically work. So he'd probably be gone with a few months anyway. And two, he can make his life a living hell. He can basically force him to. It's it, whether or not he can technically do it on day one. Yeah, that probably can't happen. But everything he, he would be gone no matter what if Trump won. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, theoretically, if Gensler really wanted, he could probably stay on as a commissioner. But he wouldn't be able to stay on as chairman because Gensler. I mean, because Trump would be able to put somebody else on as chairman, I believe. Um, and yeah, yeah the ch the chairman is chosen by the president. Like he can't yeah. fire him from the SEC, but he can fire him as the head right he still gets one vote there was one other thing that trump said that was new which he hadn't previously said and it wasn't in the republican platform so a lot of what he said was in the explicit republican plot party platform he hadn't said anything about stable coins before i thought it was notable he said he supports stable coins supports stable coins for the sake of extending dollar dominance globally that's obviously a talking point we've heard from folks like paul ryan obviously it's something that we all talk about all the time I thought it was very notable that Trump said that too. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, I mean, we like we've been. I think James has mentioned this multiple times on this podcast. Like, it just seems so obvious that we would maintain the dollar hegemony by <laughs> embracing stable coins. Hello, right? And I, I also agree the fact that it was brought up, and I don't know if it was. I, I doubt it was ad libbed, but you know the fact that it was in his speech, very, very compelling and powerful. And look, like. Whether you're a fan of Tether or Circle or not, like uh, they're all growing and and growing really, really uh, 
dramatically, I would say. Now, granted, stablecoin supply probably certainly on the circle side isn't where it used to be, et cetera. But the the kind of integrations where stablecoins are going, um, and even like PayPal, right? Releasing their their stablecoin, like it seems highly unlikely that um uh stable coins are going to somehow be um you know regulated out of the system but we haven't had any clear guidance on anything particularly stable coins and circle spends an enormous amount of time and effort and energy and money in dc lobbying and and trying to get you know things continue to move forward the fact that it was brought up uh, i do think is also quite notable for uh, for the stable coin space because whether you like it or not, it is actually probably the best use case beyond speculation for crypto right now. I mean, I certainly use it. I know other folks, especially outside of the United States, when there's demand for dollars, it's a huge boon for folks to be able to get access to stable coins. So, you know, whether we like it or not, the dollar is indirectly maintaining its digital hegemony. Uh, it would be nice for, um, I would say, the, the U.S. government to embrace that. Yeah, I mean, Nick's done a lot of work in this. I've read some of his work. I mean, if, if Circle was allowed to do interest-bearing stablecoins, I bet you they'd have way more uh, dollars <laughs> backed by Circle, right? And and Tether is typically used by people internationally who typically don't have access to U.S. bank accounts where they can earn interest, and they're just worried about the debasement. So that's why Heather, in my opinion, that's why Tether is so I. Something, sorry, James, something one out. It's actually a question for Nick, or, or uh, could be great for the audience if you could expand on on how... Uh, Tether is uh, comparable in a way to uh, euro dollars. Yeah, I don't know if Trump understands this one just yet, but uh, may maybe Vivek does. He will. Vance might. Actually, just one very quick side note is Vance has kind of suggested the dollar hegemony is actually bad for sort of yeah, like yes. middle America, uh, which is kind of a Lynn Alden, Luke Groman talking point, which I actually agree with. And so that almost yeah. trades against it's that actually almost opposes the state we should extend the reach of the dollar via stable coins talking point um but uh, yeah i don't know if the trump will achieve that level of sophistication and it's a, it's a controversial point anyway um but yeah what was the question how how did oh how are tethers like euro dollars yeah yeah i had a talk on this at token 2049 last year i think basically the idea is you know euro dollars emerged because there were various restrictions on the U.S. banking system, uh, actually including interest that could be paid, but also there was just a desire to transact outside the U.S. banking system in dollar terms uh, to avoid all of the you know sclerotic nature of that system and the risk of transactions being politicized. That story was totally recapitulated with stable coins. Crypto users had a very hard time getting banked and exchanges were not linked to the banking system. Bitfinex was the creator of Tether, or the parent org was, so that tr you know, traders could actually transact and they didn't have to use sketchy Taiwanese banks as intermediaries. And you know, initially, stablecoins were just used for settlement and collateral on exchanges, and now it's become much bigger than that. It's become a digital dollar access tool for the entire world, and all of these folks, uh, you know, X US do not have access to dollar banking. And so it's an absolute godsend. So very, very analogous to Euro dollars. Um, we're actually going to publish a report in September profiling five emerging market countries, looking at how folks in these countries are using stable coins, not for crypto stuff, but for everyday usage. Uh, and so I find that tremendously interesting. And what you see is crypto dollarization. Of course, you know, we know about this in Argentina and Venezuela, but it's it's much bigger than that. And I think it's gonna be very, very disruptive to all these sovereign currencies and potentially cause the destruction of a bunch of weaker sovereign currencies in emerging markets. And and, and something of note is uh, Euro dollars is uh, um, about $13 uh, trillion in Euro dollar deposits right now. Um, it's, it's a big market. It's bigger than the onshore dollar market, I think. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we, we, when I first started covering crypto in general back in 2017, um, we tried, I think, Nick, you also, we tried to call these crypto dollars. I mean, it's like 98% of the stable coins are, <laughs> are in dollars. So, I mean, it really is the, it is hegemony at this point, uh, whether or not how wide it goes, but it seems to be that, that, that term is not catching on. Well, speaking of, speaking of the dollar, it's probably worth talking a little bit macro since this is a crypto and macro podcast, right? Um, 
We have the Fed this week. Alex, I know you're on pins and needles One. like I am. <laughs> That's, sorry, sorry. No, no, but not, not July. No, <laughs> it's not happening, man. <laughs> it's a good bet. Yeah. I think it's a good I bet know. if you put it before. Finally, listen, listen uh. I saw the PC number and I am finally capitulating on my July call, but I am standing yeah. by 50 bits in September yeah. and I know you're only 25, but that's fine. Um, no, I, just for everyone to be aware, so this week is um, uh, literally the last day of the month uh, is, is the FOMC meeting. There are zero cuts priced. At, I mean, pretty much like 1% at this point, so you could just consider it a wrap. Um, However, it, there's a lot also going on that would, you know, that that's like after the fact of, of the, the Fed meeting. But I think it's important to, to, to understand that the next Fed meeting is until September. And so um, what we're looking for at Asymmetric is um, the language used in the press conference as it relates to weaker economic data, rising unemployment, the negative CPI print. We kind of envisage that. Uh, there's certain aspects of the economy that are slowing down. There are other aspects that are doing great. That being said, if the Fed waits too long to cut or doesn't cut enough in their first cut, um, then it's a policy error and you'll have you know the ramifications of, of the higher for longer policy. And so from, from our perspective, I think what we're kind of looking for is, you know, what is the language? Is the language dovish? Is the language, you know, we've seen some language suggesting that once they start cutting, they're not going to stop. It's not going to be like a one cut and done, kind of what what uh, the ECB did back in June. Um, there's going to be some sort of cutting for longer, if you will. Uh, and there's always the Jackson Hole event in, uh, in August. I'll be attending that this year. What we're looking for at, at Jackson Hole is to try to see, are they going to be telegraphing what is going to be happening in September and how the markets react to that. So, you know, right after the FOMC, well, maybe not right after, a couple of days later, it's also the Bank of Japan's turn. And I don't know what consensus is right now, but from what I've read, it, there appears to be a view that they may end up hiking rates. And so dollar yen recently, I guess it topped on the dollar side, bottom for the yen, started to, to, to pull back. So I think one of the things that we're looking at, uh, like, from foreign exchange is on, on Wednesday, how does the dollar react to the tone of the Fed, assuming that they don't cut, which I don't think they, they will cut at this point. And then also, how does that impact the yen on, on Friday morning um, when the Bank of Japan is up? So Alex, do you have any uh, any perspective on you know the dollar yen trade or, or how you're planning for the Fed on, on Wednesday? Yeah, I think uh, Wednesday is a non-event. It's going to be basically uh, no cuts there, and it's it's priced in. As you say, it's all about the language. Uh, I, I think, and this is kind of like uh, I, I gather there is market expectation is Powell is going to prepare uh, the market for September cuts. So the language is going to change. They're going to change the language on the on the statement, and then reinforces on the presser objective there being pretty much uh, minimize volatility and trying to be predictable. Emphasis on 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 good inflation numbers that are that are actually now consistently uh, coming coming very well. On if one cut or two cut and the economy in general, um, I, I want to make emphasis on on high frequency data. And if you look at, for example, the Dallas uh, um, Economic Index, uh, the the WEI, it's actually it's been ramping up since early June. So the point there being is there there are things in the economy that are actually doing very well. And they're not recessionary at all. Uh, this this worry that is always lingering in the back among many people in crypto about uh, we going into hard landing. The probability is always there. We don't predict. We don't have crystal balls, unfortunately. But it's it's very very low probability. Oh. That being said, if they they if like we only get one cut this year, I think would likely be a policy mistake. Uh, we need more than that, uh, and 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 we need to be steady. Then on, on the BOJ, is the, they're going to hike again, uh, 25 bips expectation, pretty much baked in. The question is, how much are they going to taper the QE, the, 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 the Japanese QE? And that can drive even further move down on dollar yen. And this usually does not matter, but in this case, it matters because it's been, it's been going up for so long. Uh, and it's basically used for for panting lever, putting lever trades on uh, on U.S. assets, uh, or in general, but U.S. assets in particular. Basically, with the funding rates being so low in Japan, you get funding. This is the carry trade, basically, for the audiences. You 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 fund yourself on yen 
locally, and then you take that and you reinvest or, or you put that money to work on things that pay more to, to make money, you lever it up, right? And that's uh, uh, US rates uh, all across the curve. It's, it can also be US equities. Um, and uh, and if, if the dollar yen, basically, if, if the funding gets higher, uh, it makes your, uh, your, your, it forces you, if you have a carry trade position on, to reduce the size. And usually this is not a problem, but it can happen. You basically open up the door to, to trigger a, a, a cascade of uh, risk and wind. So yeah, there is risk there. But I think that mainly happened about uh, like a week ago, and it's kind of like in the price right now. Like the, the time to panic was a week ago. And then Jackson Hole, it's, uh, it's, we forget about Jackson Hole, but we, we, we have a recent, consistent recent history of the Fed coming in on Jackson Hole, Powell, and basically tanking the market, right? So fingers crossed that uh, it remains a non-event. We look into the FOMC in September. And, and that being said, for me, to me, the most important thing is not the Fed at this point, is, is the, for, for Bitcoin, right? Not for equities. Is the, the, the Trump Kamala play is like who wins uh that's what really we, we really care about the most i think till november i i have the chart up for those watching on video just a little shout out to joe here we are pricing for about a 110 percent chance of cuts which means we're priced for more than one cut right now potentially so the odds are up there but it's the market's still mostly expecting one i'll go on record and say oh, i'm only expecting one 25 basis point cut um but yeah we'll see I don't Man, know. you guys yeah. gotta get more aggressive you know come on <laughs> I think I think we could get three before the end of the year. I just don't think we're going to get two in September. Okay. I think the market's only pricing two for the most part now. But I think we I think we could get three. I'm actually concerned uh, if if we get two in September that it may be interpreted by enough people as the Fed uh, getting worried about hard landing, like like, like wrong messaging. There's, there's a probability that is not uh, minuscule that actually if we get two. It's actually, instead of being bullish cuts, it's bearish cuts. Yeah. Lower rates theoretically should be good for, for crypto, but <laughs> things have gone crazy in the past. Uh, before we move on, the, the Trump and Kamala trade, I think is, um, or Kamala, sorry, <laughs> trade. We should go back. We didn't really touch on the fact that while the Bitcoin conference is going on, the Harris campaign kind of reached out and wanted to do like a, a reset with crypto companies. Um, there are certain people in the crypto camp that are unhappy about this. Uh, my view is like, as, if this can be less partisan, the better. I I, pref I prefer it to be bipartisan. I I don't know why anyone in the camp like the odds are like super super strong that Trump is are unanimously going to win and it's going to be better for the crypto industry. I mean, there's still there's still a decent chance that uh, Harris could win, the Dems could win. So I don't know why you wouldn't want to sit down with them. I know there are people in this industry who strongly disagree with me on that. Uh, we also have a letter um, from a bunch of, I think, 15 different Democrats basically um, asking them to kind of like same thing, go over crypto policy, be a little more open to it in, in a way that the Biden admin has not, which really, as far as we told with this podcast and many other podcasts, Nick, you've talked about on yours, uh, it's the Warrenites of the world. It's the Michael Barrs at the Fed, the Marty Gruenbergs, the FDIC, the uh, Gary Gensler at the SEC. Um, and it seems like that no matter what happens, it, we'll see what happens over the next few months, but it seems like even if the Dems do win, it should be at worst neutral, but it, it should even be more positive for this industry uh, than a Biden admin would have been. I don't, what are your guys' thoughts on, on uh, Harris reaching out and saying she wants to reset? We'll start with you, Nick. Cause do you guys from, you, you, I know you have Do you thoughts. remember in, I think, 2012 when Hillary Clinton went to Russia and she gave them a button that had the word reset written on it? symbolically is this a political thing that you guys remember and reset was actually they misspelled it in russian and said something completely something different <laughs> it i don't know it's like <laughs> I, I you know, that's accelerate so or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, this was like a major gaffe and of course we did not reset relations with russia in fact they got much much worse that's what this reset reminds me of I don't believe that uh, Kamala. How do you pronounce her name? Kamala. Sorry, I'm not. I, I, I don't know. I just say uh, Harris. BP. Yeah, I don't want to say Adam Harris. Harris. Sure. Adam Harris. Yeah. yeah. I don't believe that she will ever be pro crypto because she is a progressive. When she was in the Senate, she was the furthest left senator by by her voting record, and progressives don't like crypto. 
you know, they they tip I'm generalizing, but they would prefer that the state largely be in control of, you know, financial activities for the sake of pushing policies. Um, you know, you can talk about the various forms that takes, but that seems to be my interpretation. And crypto is all about transacting outside the ambit of the state. And, um, you know, these ideas around hard money, these are sort of like conservative libertarian ideas. And so I do think there is something about crypto fundamentally. There is an impregnated ideology that is perceived as hostile by the progressive camp. So I don't believe that, uh, you know, there will ever be a sincere embrace of crypto by, by the left. Um, as much as it would be convenient for crypto to be a nonpartisan. So I'm not taking the reset concept seriously. I do think they have understood now that electorally this is a losing issue for them because no one really votes for people because they hate crypto, but they will vote for you because you like crypto. So it's very asymmetric for them. Um, so I think they're kind of trying to panic a little bit and want to see how they can reverse Trump's gains from his crypto embrace. But I don't believe this will be an authentic embrace of the industry. I almost completely agree with with Nick. Like this is politics at its finest, right? They saw the metrics, they saw the activity, they saw the fundraising and they were like, uh oh, <laughs> we can't be this way anymore. And I mean, you saw this with with uh, what happened with um, you know the 180 with the Biden administration when when before Biden you know dropped out back in late May or June, it was it, it seemed so it seemed pretty obvious that this was a, a, an about face for political reasons. And so, would I like progressives to be engaging with stuff like crypto? Yes. Uh, do I think Trump aligning himself with crypto is going to piss off progressives even more about crypto? Probably. And so, I don't think that there's a lot of I don't put a lot of weight into the Harris campaign's desire to, say, build a comprehensive regulatory framework around crypto. I think they're trying to score some probably cheap political points and did some game theorizing and looked at it and said, it's probably better for us to at least appear that we're open to resetting and the conversation versus actually doing something. And I will note, I, I was probably overly broad in my statement. There are a small handful of progressives that are pro crypto. I think you could describe Brokana as a progressive and Richie Torres, perhaps, but it is certainly not the sort of like your typical progressive. They're certainly not pro crypto. Yeah, I think I think the overwhelming trend is the younger senator. It's it's Republican and skews younger is the two areas that uh, pro crypto people tend to skew. So. Hopefully that younger part of it uh, picks up steam. I, I pulled up next tweet here for those uh, watching at home, but I wanted to point out a couple, one that I, I think is, is really true here is um, one, end regime of regulatory opacity, which we talked about, but also stop harassing Bitcoin miners for simply buying energy, which is pretty critical. And I, I don't think even if we do get some of the more positive things um, on like crypto regulations and, and what have you. I do think it's going to be hard for them to ever like come on board with with that view of things, right? Like I I, I don't think that's the the Bitcoin mining side of things is something that they're ever going to fully get on board with, even if they do kind of open up a little bit on the crypto side of things. If that's something you truly care about, yeah, that was an interesting moment in Trump's speech when he started talking about AI, and a lot of people didn't understand the connection, but it's very crystal clear to me. It's Trump's advance in particular platform is re-energizing, re-industrializing the American heartland and being opposed to energy intensive industries is counterproductive. It's hostile to labor. It's hostile to creating a new American industry. And so it's natural for the Trump fans admin to oppose politicizing energy for Bitcoin miners or for, or for AI data centers, which is becoming and an actually a much bigger issue and that will eclipse Actually, in, in my view, my projection is it'll eclipse the energy consumed by Bitcoin miners. So I thought those points were perfectly coherent, although a lot of people didn't like them. Yeah, no, I'm with you 100%, Nick. I would, uh, the last thing I want to say about the Bitcoin conference is I did um, two panels. I interviewed Robbie Mitch, Nick. One thing that I want to talk about before we go to the ETTS, which I'll have some comments from those guys as well. Um, we, uh, Jan Van Eck on stage was talking about how everyone involved in crypto tends to talk about this like 3% allocation mark, 2 to 3%. That's what their clients are doing. That's what they're doing. And he was like, but every single person I talked to involved in Bitcoin on the other side has way higher percentage allocation than that. 
And, and he was like, and, and then he said, I'm one of those people. And I was like, basically hinting at it. And I asked him, I was like, are you going to tell us how much it is? And he's the CEO of VanEck, one of the largest ETF issuers in the US. And he threw out there that he has over 30% of his personal investment portfolio in Bitcoin. So I thought that was like eye opening for me. I couldn't believe he actually set it up on stage on the main stage there. But that was, I just wanted to throw that out there as something that like, for those listening, there are people. He also said Bitcoin was in his blood um, up on stage because his firm basically got, they got their start because they started offering uh, gold mutual funds and investing gold miners and stuff back when holding physical gold was legal. That's how they became known for what they are. So they, he's fully on board with that. So I thought that was critical, but ETH ETFs debuted the day before the Bitcoin ETF launch. I'm going to say this, the volume is pretty damn good. Um, it's trading about 20 to 25% of what the Bitcoin ETF did in the first few days. That said, uh, the flows aren't great. They've had net outflows of about 340 million. Um, all, all of that is coming from Grayscale's ETH E for the most part. Uh, well, not for the most part, all of it is coming in. So a lot of it's coming out. A bunch of it's coming back into the other ETFs, it seems, uh, but net on a net basis, a lot of it's coming out. So um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on the ETH ETFs uh, on their launch and what your expectations are. So James, I'll just ask you directly, like, was this kind of in line with what you and, and Bakunas were assuming would happen? Volume wise, yes, this is right. I thought they were going to do that like a quarter, a little bit less than a quarter of the volume that the Bitcoin ETFs did. Just that that was our guess, 15 to 25 percent. We thought flows would be the same over like the first six months, maybe. Um, flows, it's still very early, right? Like the Bitcoin ETFs, the first 10 days also had they, they had a bunch of days of outflows. They had net inflows overall because the first day was massive. Um, but but for the most part, it was 10 days of outflows that were net aside, like. There was a bunch of days of outflows. And then after that, that's when things really started picking up. That's when everyone started covering all the money pouring in. Then it slowed down again. And then we went into another wave of massive inflows. And now we're at 17.5 billion on the Bitcoin ETFs. I don't think the Ethereum ETFs are going to get there. I don't think Wall Street and advisors are as keen on Ethereum as they do. It's it's a little bit harder to understand um, for many reasons. Um, I think, Nick, you also agree with that kind of sense. So like, can you what what are you hearing from the people you talk to and on the Wall Street side of things, or what you're understanding from what you're reading? I think Ethereum has a narrative problem, and also just its narrative hasn't been as seasoned on Wall Street. Um, we've had 15 years to understand Bitcoin, and for that to percolate into the boardrooms and uh, you know anyone that's an allocator, and uh, you know Bitcoin is its story is simple. It's you know a digital gold that is fairly well understood. Um, Ethereum is is stuck in the middle, and I think this actually plays to Solana's benefit, which is Solana is newer, it's shinier, and actually its metrics look very good. We can maybe touch on that. Um, it's more performant. Ethereum isn't sure what, like even Ethereum people aren't sure what Ethereum is. Is it a Bitcoin-like asset where you're focusing on the scarcity and the deflationary aspect? And... You know, are you focusing on uh, capital return to token holders via fees and you know burning, burning the tokens as people use Ethereum more? Are you focusing on making uh, L twos cheap and making transactions as cheap as possible? Those things kind of trade off against each other. So Ethereum is constantly vacillating between these two. Like, are we going to be responsible to the token holders and create these capital return mechanisms? Or are we going to actually appease the users and make it as cheap as and we're going to make block space abundant those things are opposed to each other i don't think wall street's probably not having that conversation but i think even ethereum itself has an identity crisis and uh so it doesn't surprise me that maybe the launch wasn't as hot as the bitcoin one it was very notable i thought that ethereum kind of sold off on the day and solana rallied that i thought was the market telling us something <laughs> actually i don't know yeah. how likely it is we get a solana yeah. etf but that was kind of my big takeaway, actually. Yeah, the the thing that's there's a couple things that that stood out to me <clears throat> with respect to the the Ethereum ETF. Um, and, and by the way, like Nick, I, I echo your sentiment. We had a we had a, a an episode previously where I was like, Bitcoin, it's digital gold. It's like so easy to sell that. It's like Ethereum, it's what is it? And then Alex kind of like rambled out some stuff and I was like, yeah, exactly. It's too difficult <laughs> to explain. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you get a wall street guy to sell this thing? Right. So, um, but what, one of the things that we did cover, I think a couple of weeks ago was we, we, I think, uh, many of us believed that the ETH E outflows wouldn't be as pr profound or pronounced as, as the, um, 
the GBTC outflows, mostly because there wasn't like these forced liquidations or forced sellers or huge basis trades unwinding, et cetera. Um, turned out to be dead wrong. I mean, the, the ETH, you, you, they slapped that 150 basis point fee on it and everybody else is 10 to 15 to 20 to 25. And it's just, it's getting, you know, pummeled again in terms of outflows. And so uh, I think that caught some people off by surprise, but to your point, Nick, about the, the reaction for Solana, obviously I'm the, the Solana bull here. Um, and what what has stood out to me about Solana uh, and its reaction to the ETH ETF, on the one hand, we saw this actually happen with Ethereum when the Bitcoin ETF finally arrived uh, and was trading as ETH ripped um, in the expectation of the next ETF. And I think that is largely becoming consensus. Whether this happens or not, to your point, is, you know, we're not entirely sure if, if a Solana ETF is a slam dunk. I think Van X kind of call option they bought was a Trump presidency, and that will likely lead towards something like a Solana ETF getting approved. But it's it's easily a year away. I think James mentioned this a, a while back. But it does underscore, I think, some of the points around the metrics with Solana. Uh, most recently, you know, the, the total trading volume um, has flipped Ethereum, and it's still like one-fifth the value of Ethereum. Now, I have had these... Um, intellectual discussions with uh, some some big Ethereum proponents around, well, you have to include the layer twos in that. And I think that this is a, a point that that is worth debating because before L2s were a thing, how did you compare Ethereum to Solana? As a layer one, right? Where you had, you know, data availability, uh, execution, all of these consensus were all within one thing. Well, now, the Ethereum community has chosen to abstract out execution into layer twos and folks want to make the argument, well, you should be, you should be comparing Solana's layer one to the layer twos. And I'm like, no, so Solana hasn't chosen to outsource its execution to a, a different layer. If somebody chooses to do that, well, then maybe we should compare those two. And the, the, the metrics are astonishing. I, I don't, you know, I think uh, I got to give a uh, tip my hat to, to Kyle Samani over at Multicoin. He, he mentioned in a tweet recently that they don't ever really promise anything to their LPs. But one thing that he, you know, uh, confirmed or, or affirmed to them was that Solana was going to flip Ethereum and all the, the key metrics. And we're starting to see that. So is this impacting ETH ETF flows? I'm not entirely sure. I think the, 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 the point about like, how do you sell this thing on Wall Street? And does it have enough familiarity with uh, folks in the boardrooms, etc. Is, is likely a bigger proponent. But you know, I've been saying this for a while, like the relative value trade for Ethereum versus Solana continues to favor for Solana. And so as the metrics increase, as activity continues to increase, and the kind of spectrum of applications that are getting built on top of Solana, coupled with some of the upgrades that are coming, it's not like if you don't have bag holder bias, it's, it's hard to look at it objectively and say, I should be overweight Ethereum versus something like Solana here. I, I, so on stage, I did ask both Robbie and, and everyone on stage, and Jan obviously believes that Solana is next and it could happen within a year because Jan Van had filed for Solana E10. BlackRock, even on our, our TV show today on Bloomberg, uh, one of the CIO for, for index products at BlackRock said, we're not thinking about anything else. Robbie basically said it's, it's Bitcoin, then Ethereum, and then the next thing is so far down that they're not even concerned about it right now. I mean, BlackRock is building on Ethereum with their bid fund and other stuff. I don't know how much of that is just like talking points versus are they actually looking into this? Uh, but as you said, yeah, I think we're we're likely a ways away from a Solana ETF absent a Trump victory and some massive run up. But the final deadline for those applications is the end of March, and so if Trump gets in on January 20th, I don't know how much he can really change to get these things launched uh, by then. But I think Solana it makes sense as the next chain is my overall view, and I will say. Shout out to Steve McClurg real quick, who's used to be one of the main guys. Run, he, he's at uh, Valkyrie, uh, which is now owned by CoinShares. I have a bet with him. He's been super bearish on the Ethereum ETF, the flows of interest. Uh, and he's, I owe him a, a deal at PubKey if it's under 15% of the Bitcoin ETFs after six months. Um, so if it's over, he gives me a meal. But uh, it, right now, I am definitely losing that considering they are negative um, since launch a week ago. I have a, a question question for Joe. Um, how do you uh, 
respond to the criticism towards Solana that uh, Fire Dancer is just a way for Jamp to extract value from retail. I'm very curious what you think on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> good start. Yeah, I, I, yeah. It, it's a, it's a uh, thing, you know. You know, it's a thing. What a, what a classic crypto Twitter um, loaded question. So, look, I mean, I don't, I don't, I am friends with the guys that jump, but I don't. I'm not an investor. You can't even invest in them. So, um, I don't have any dog in this race, except that I love the fact that some of the smartest computer scientists on the planet are trying to synchronize global state at the speed of light. I think that that's pretty awesome. And I think retail actually benefits from that. But let's be clear here. Jump is a for-profit business. And the way that they've been able to dominate the market making and algorithmic trading space is by creating customized hardware, FPGAs and ASICs, to run their software on, right? So it's not a stretch to think that Jump is going to release Fire Dancer, which arguably improves everybody's usage of Solana that's using Solana. Um, but if they... If, and I don't know if they'll do this, but it's not that hard. It's not a big logical leap to assume that they may end up by building custom hardware to run Fire Dancer on to be slightly faster than somebody else, um, that they're going to make money from it. I mean, that is their core business, right? They make markets and they're really, really good at it. So is this a way to screw over retail? I mean, look, for years now, the narrative whenever markets get really bearish is jump is pulling out of crypto. Jump is no longer involved in crypto. And it's just never true. And so could somebody make the case that, you know, Jump is aiming to screw over retail? Sure, somebody could make that case. Is that their core business? Not at all. So I just don't, I don't buy it. And also Fire Dancer is an open source client. So if somebody wants to fork it and, and make it something else, they can do that. And I think that this is a kind of a, a big leap in the way that a, a market making firm like jump is doing is that they're embracing the open source nature of software development these days to the extent that they're paying literally some of the world's top computer scientists to work on something that's ultimately going to be free like to me as a big open source guy that's awesome but it's also testament to the fact that like if they were trying to screw over retail don't you think they would be doing it in a closed source fashion Quite, Nick's got to run soon, but I actually have a quick question for him before he has to run. So you're, you obviously, you're a VC, so you're investing across different ecosystems and platforms, Nick, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana. Are you like, are you like, how do you compare and like when you're looking at investing in a deal, like how are you viewing the Solana ecosystem when compared to Ethereum? We're probably more active in, uh, in Solana than Ethereum right now. Uh, we, we don't uh, come in with a particular sort of normative view of what chain entrepreneurs should be building on we let we defer to them on that but just in terms of deal count by the numbers i would say we're seeing more founders come to us and say they're building on solana at the moment but we generally take a, a pretty hands-off approach in terms of ecosystem focus uh alex did you have anything to add on the Solana versus Ethereum side of things? Oh, yeah. Uh, two, two, two things. Well, one is I think that, uh, by the way, I was wrong on, 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 on the, on the uh, ETF. I mean, volumes came in exactly where I thought they would come in. Uh, but uh, I was not expecting such a massive outflow that fast. Uh, but th that being said, I think it's like, uh, first of all, it's, uh, I, am, I, I prefer uh, a combination of Bitcoin and Solana over Ethereum. I think that would out outperform uh, uh, ETH. Uh, that being said, it's people are being binary and have a tendency to basically go to the extremes and, and, and generate all this drama and panic. It's the ETF is still something that is positive in the mid to long run for Ethereum. It's going to drive inflows. How people think about it is like basically if Bitcoin is running and you're you're lagging and you need to deploy, you look around and say, okay, I'm going to buy some ETH ETF. Uh, flows will come in. It's, it's going to be positive for as soon as Grayscale is over, it's going to be positive on, uh, on a net basis for, for Ethereum. Um, uh, another thought is on, on adding uh, the layer twos. I don't think, I don't think a layer two should be added, but if you have to, to, to if you're going to do that, you also need to add the, uh, the valuations, right? 
not not just the transactions. It's like okay, it's, then it's not just ETH market cap. It's ETH plus Arbitrum plus plus Optimism plus the three hundred layer twos that are right now in Ethereum, right? So it, it gets meatier. Uh, and 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 the other thought is. This is uh, an analogy from from a, a friend of mine who uh, who's been in crypto for a long time. Um, that uh, we we're just talking about this over the week, and and uh, he said basically, uh, Bitcoin is digital gold. Uh, Ethereum is like AWS, and uh, Solana is like the App Store. And uh, I thought it was it's a, I think it's a pretty good analogy. I'd agree with that. And yeah, there's room for all three. So it's yeah. Yeah, I kind of view it as like I, I the other thing that I, I didn't mention that Robbie Mitch I did say was that he doesn't view Ethereum or Solana as uh, true competitors to Bitcoin. He views them as being complementary um, in many cases to Bitcoin. I kind of agree with it. I kind of think of like Bitcoin has the whole store of value um, kind of narrative, even the exchange narrative down. And I think the other layer ones are all competing for a different large arguably larger total addressable market size it's just that there's way more competition in there and it remains to be seen who will long term own that market share thanks for joining us for this episode of bits and bips we'll be back in two weeks to discuss more about how the world's crypto and macro are colliding till then